Hey folks, Greg Marchand here. Welcome to another episode of the Virtual Instructor-Led Training Program brought to you by the Service Sales Academy. In this episode, we're gonna do another technical knowledge for service advisors focused on hybrid vehicle basics. Hybrids are really prominent in the marketplace now, as you probably know by now. And the more you know about anything technical, especially hybrids, the more you're gonna be able to sell. The more confidence you'll have, that confidence will come across in your sales process, and the better questions you're gonna ask of the customers and of your technicians. And everything's just gonna to work together to get better and better and better at selling. Hybrids exist for a few reasons. The most common thought reason is increased fuel economy. And yes, they do increase fuel economy. They also reduce emissions. And that's probably the biggest reason that hybrids exist. You could also make the case that hybrids exist to bridge the gap between internal combustion engine technology and full-on electric vehicles. And we're kind of, you know, we're kind of in the process of, of moving. It's gonna take years, many, many years of moving from internal combustion engines to full-on electric vehicles and hybrids will, will bridge that gap because they can, they can combine performance with fuel economy, which helps bridge the gap, and then it also helps get customers more used to this range anxiety thing. That one of the big problems with electric vehicles is customers think, well, what happens when the battery goes dead and I'm not at my destination? And they call it range anxiety. And so, so hybrids get, get customers kind of used to part of the electrical vehicle thing without any range anxiety, okay? And that's, that's the, the big thing with plug-in hybrids. All right, yeah, you can plug it into the wall and charge it up if you want. Well, that makes it an electric vehicle. Oh, but we have an internal combustion engine there just in case. Oh, okay, well it gets me over by, I'm not gonna get there because my battery went dead thing. But the biggest reason hybrids exist is really reduced emissions, believe it or not. A hybrid vehicle, to, to define a hybrid vehicle, is it's a vehicle that uses both an, an internal combustion engine, we call that ICE, and we can't call it a motor anymore, think about that, because it's got this internal combustion engine and it's got electric motors, and they both move the vehicle. So when we say motor, now we're talking about the electric motor, and when we say engine, we're talking about the full-on engine like we've, like we've always experienced. In some hybrid vehicles, the engine will run to create electricity to recharge the battery and to make the vehicle go, to provide go power, I call it. In other hybrids, the electricity can be replenished by plugging into a charging station or by running the engine. So we're talking a difference between, and, and these are, there's a third type of hybrid too. It's called a, a mild hybrid. And I don't remember if that's in here or not, but, but when we talk about full hybrids, we either have the early hybrids or we have the plug-in hybrids. The early hybrids you couldn't plug into the wall or plug into a charging station, I should say. Plug into a charging station and recharge the battery. You had to use the internal combustion engine. In the plug-in hybrids, we can use the engine and we can use the charging station, okay? So that, that's what this slide is talking about. Here's full versus mild. The, the full hybrids will use those electric motors and, and high voltage batteries to move the vehicle. The mild hybrids will use an electric motor to assist the engine. In other words, the engine runs all the time, except maybe when the vehicle's at a stop. But otherwise, the engine's running all the time in a mild hybrid. In a full hybrid, it can power itself with just the battery and the electric motors, or it can, or it can run the engine to recharge the battery and to provide drive force, whichever it may be. Most most hybrids, I want to think about this before I say this, because now it's on video. Uh, most hybrids on the road today are full hybrids. We don't have a ton of mild hybrids out there anymore. We, we did early on, but most hybrids, when people talk about hybrids, they're full on hybrids. We've got, um, a bunch of useful hybrid vehicle animations. I was gonna, gonna bring some to you, but, but it was just it was gonna make this presentation a little bit longer than I wanted it to. If you wanna see some of the animations as to where the power flows from the battery to the motors through the engine and all this stuff, uh, just Google the internet for hybrid vehicle animations. And there's a bunch out there. People have grabbed some from Toyota and from Nissan and from Honda and, and they've stuck them in YouTube videos and whether it was licensed or not, I don't know. So I, again, I wasn't gonna grab those. Um, but, but if you wanna see power flow, if you're, if you're really into this type of stuff, go ahead and, and you know, just Google hybrid vehicle animations and you'll find a whole bunch of videos that will support this presentation. Older hybrid vehicles, you know, starting back in, in 1999, 2000, somewhere in there, used nickel metal hydride batteries. And these batteries are, 
are just like what you have in a cordless drill. I, no lie, they're basically the same thing. They're just a heck of a lot bigger, way more voltage. They're very, very reliable and they're very, very durable. Originally, some manufacturers also allowed them to be serviced. We, we could identify bad cells and replace cells. And, and there's some organizations that will still do that. It was a very, very, and is a very, very stable chemical technology. It just, it was a known entity. It was heavy though, which was the problem. Stable, reliable, durable, but heavy. And when you're talking about driving a vehicle on electricity, weight is everything because it affects rolling resistance and that'll affect everything else in terms of ultimately fuel economy with the vehicle. The newer hybrid vehicles will use lithium ion batteries and lithium ion uh, that technology has come a long way. It, it stores a lot more energy than a, than a nickel metal hybrid, hydride rather, or, a, or a conventional battery. Unfortunately, they're less chemically stable, and so they require a lot more computer mo monitoring, a lot more computer regulation, and you don't want to just buy a lithium ion hybrid battery from any old place because that chemical stability will cause what they call a runaway thermal event. That would be a fire uh, that you can't put out, by the way. And so <clears throat> lithium ion batteries took a while to get into the marketplace. They're stable enough now to use them for a lot of the plug-in hybrids. Uh, they do provide a lot longer range, both operating range and fuel range of these automobiles. They're way more stable than they used to be. They're not perfect. There's a reason when you get it on an airplane that they announce before you get on, if you're gonna check your baggage, please remove any spare lithium ion batteries. The reason they announce that is because a lot of the lithium ion batteries that come out of other places in the world are not as chemically stable as they should be and they will set themselves on fire. And so, you know, there's certainly still challenges with lithium ion. Bottom line is we, we still don't have a good handle on battery technology. That's the one thing holding up all of this is battery technology. Major components of a hybrid automobile, the internal combustion engine, just like in a conventional automobile, right? And then we've got motor generator units, which you can think of those as, as a transaxle in the sense that they are combined with that transaxle. Engineers will keep them separate, but um, they often look like they're in one unit. So you could think of those together. So we've got a, an engine and a transaxle. It's got some, some motor generators in it. We've got an inverter that's gonna sit between the high voltage battery and the, and the engines, and that's gonna convert DC stored direct current energy in that battery into alternating current energy to make the motor do its thing. We've of course got the high voltage battery, which I will, I'll admit that, you know, back in the day I was training on, on hybrids before Toyota launched them, and, and I really wished back then that we would have called the HV battery something other than a battery because the price of the battery is what freaks everybody out. They hear battery and they think double A, triple A, oh, automotive battery, 80, 90, 150 bucks. And then they find out a high voltage battery is 3,000, 4,000, 6,000 dollars and they freak. Well, we should have called it a flux capacitor for crying out loud because that, that is a major component. It's no different than the engine in a car today. And if you told the customer the engine is gonna cost $4,000 to be replaced, they go, hey, that's cheap. Well, we shouldn't have called it a high voltage battery because it's a major component. Without that, the car's not gonna go anywhere. And then we've got a, a bunch of wiring, we've got regular wiring, we've got high voltage wiring, and then some very specific hybrid control units. And, and this, is, this is a partial list. Hybrids, they're, we can call them complex and you can, you can go deep down that rabbit hole. The reality is you've got a battery, you've got an inverter, you've got some sort of drive unit with motors and a transaxle in it, and you've got, a, you've got an engine. And really it's, it's those four things plus some wiring. And, and if anything goes wrong, you're gonna replace one of those five things. And that, that's the reality of it. They're, they've got more parts than this and they are complex, but really all those parts are, are combined in, in something here. The major differences between hybrid and conventional automobiles is regenerative braking, the high voltage battery, the motor generator units, and the, and the, the computer technology in terms of control systems. Okay, regenerative braking I'll talk about in a second, but that, that's essentially turning the, the motion of the automobile back into electricity rather than turning it into heat like we do in a conventional braking system. So because we have motors, 
we can make them generators if we run them backwards. And, and that gives us regenerative braking. And then we've got that high voltage battery that sits back there, and we've already discussed that. That's definitely different. We've got electric motor and generators that, yeah, we have an alternator, we have a starter motor and a conventional car. Well, these are the same thing, they're just bigger, and they're combined into one unit. And then we've got, again, like I say, the, the control system technology and the, the programming that makes all of this work really well together. Regenerative braking systems, you're starting to see on some conventional automobiles too, as, as technology increases, they'll convert that vehicle motion to electricity to slow the vehicle down. Remember, when we talk in the, in the brake system video, how we slow a car down is by converting vehicle motion, not to electricity, but to heat because it's energy, and energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but only turn from one form to another. So in a conventional car, you step on the brake, we convert all that motion energy into heat energy and it dissipates into the atmosphere. Well, in an in electric vehicle or in a, in a hybrid vehicle, we can, we can take that energy and we can convert it to electricity, which is a different form of energy than heat and we can store that back in the battery. The motor generator units will, will get driven and they'll convert that wheel motion into the electricity and then the inverter and the control system regulates that flow of electricity back to the battery. And based on the flow of electricity, we'll get varying levels of, of braking action depending on, on you know, what we're asking for as a, as a driver, as an, as an input. Okay, so complex, but it's just converting energy. It's just, it's doing the same thing a regular brake system does. It, instead of heat, converts it to electricity, okay? Um, the, the drive wheels will spin the motor generator unit, so the wheels of the car become the input to the unit, which makes it a generator. And then the electromagnetism, and we won't get into the physics of that, just cause all this to get pushed back at the battery through the inverter. And the inverter is the magic. It either you know, sends it back to a motor to drive the car or back to the battery if we need the battery to be charged. Some, and, and again, we could, we could go on for hours with, with hybrid vehicle basics here, but regenerative braking was, was one of the big things. Um, the hybrid battery was one of the big things too, right? And we've, we've talked about the hybrid battery. There are, are unique considerations in the operation of these, these automobiles that, that you just want to have an awareness of. You don't want them to run out of fuel because if you, if you run many of them out of gasoline, it will cause the high voltage battery to deplete and you're not going to recharge it. It takes special tools from the factory people to recharge some of these batteries. So you don't ever want it to run out of fuel or it becomes a dealer issue and then it's a bigger issue because the dealer's not gonna have the technology to take care of this. The factory's going to have to do it. They'll work that out over time, but it is a challenge. You don't ever wanna let a hybrid run out of gasoline. High voltage is there almost all the time. So make sure the technicians, before they work on some of these systems, get the proper training. It's not rocket science. It's not crazy over the top dangerous. These systems are really, really good at protecting themselves. And because of that, they're really, really good at protecting you and me. But still, technicians should have some training. The high voltage battery is a major component, just like the engine or transmission. They're extremely durable. They're, they are extremely long lasting. There's no concern with a high voltage battery whatsoever. I've seen original batteries go three and 400,000 miles on some of these cars, no lie. They were never the issue everybody thought they were going to be. But if they do need to be replaced due to you know, accident or whatever might happen, yeah, they're expensive. They're a major component. They're just like a transmission or just like an engine. The car's not gonna run without it. So call it the flux capacitor when you're selling it rather than the battery, just kidding. Um, all the other conventional systems are they're, they're pretty normal. You know, they, they've, got a, they've got a smaller 12 volt battery to run the 12 volt systems. They, the, the engine operates for all intents and purposes like a regular engine. Uh, you know, the, the radio is still the radio, the headlights are still the headlights. All of that stuff is quote unquote normal and, and what we're used to and anybody can service this. I would suggest to you that if a customer suggests that their fuel economy is not what they wanted it to be, if they you know, went out and bought a used one or even a new one, that rolling resistance is everything with a hybrid in terms of fuel economy and rolling resistance relates directly to tire pressure. There are hybrid systems out there by certain manufacturers that use low rolling resistance tires. And if you replace those tires with a conventional tire, fuel economy suffered. 
the, the amount of energy it takes to push that vehicle down the road will directly affect fuel economy because the more electricity is used to move it, the more electricity we're going to have to put back. And when we put it back, we run the engine to put it back and the engine consumes fuel just like a normal engine does. All right, so, so tire pressure, operating temperature, rolling resistance, all of that stuff, very, very critical to proper fuel economy with a hybrid. When things go wrong with a hybrid, you get warning lights. I, that, it, like I said earlier, they're really, really, really good at protecting themselves. And you know, sometimes a warning light will put it into limp mode, um, other times they'll just be on and, and you know, nothing, nothing major will be happening. But if a warning light comes on in a hybrid, the customer's got to get it to you. They've got to get it to a service center and, and get it looked at. Uh, you know, these limp modes, the, the car won't act funny, it just won't go very fast at all. The mill on, the uh, brake light coming on, oil pressure, all that, all those lights still exist because they're all related to the, the conventional systems. There'll be a master warning light, which we see on conventional automobiles now. Anyway, there'll be a, uh, on some vehicles, a hybrid warning light. But if any light comes on in a hybrid, they've got to get diagnostics performed and, and get the system taken care of. Remember, hybrids are really, really, really good at protecting themselves. And because of that, they're really good at protecting us. It is extremely unlikely, like almost can never happen, that any of that high voltage electricity can do damage to any one of us. It just, the system will shut itself down if it's even a possibility. And I can promise you, I've had, I've had misadventures with hybrids as a, as a technical specialist, uh, including one that was full of water and we didn't know it. And we discovered it and hey, we're all still standing here. Nothing bad happened. And that was the worst case scenario that we always talked about. Uh, we, ha we had it, we pulled a drain plug and it poured water for a good 10 minutes. Somehow the, under the seat where the cooling fans were and where the, where the high voltage battery was, it had collected inches of water because um, the car had been sitting with the windows open and the system shut itself down. And it gave us it gave us a short circuit code. <laughs> yeah, it really had a short circuit, but nobody got hurt working on it, and nobody got hurt towing it in. So they're really, really, really safe. There's challenges though. Uh, you know, lack of maintenance still will affect these. Low tire pressure, as we as we mentioned, will result in that that poor fuel economy. Um, you know, the dead battery, the small conventional battery. If that goes dead, the electrical systems will not operate. And so the car will not operate. And so we still need to, to keep that battery charged. Um, they, they generally are glass, absorb glass mat batteries. So they don't, they don't vent because some of them are, are located inside the automobile rather than outside the automobile like we're used to. Uh, some, some of these hybrids, it's obvious where the battery is and, and you can still open the hood and jump start it. Others, you need to get the hood open and they've got jump start terminals under the hood because the battery is hidden in the back behind a locked trunk, okay? Um, so just, you know, small common challenges, but all your service repair information will have all the information to service those things. And, you know, sometimes there are customer induced situations with hybrids, the, um, the high voltage batteries are really susceptible to heat. And a lot of these things have certain thermal management systems, air conditioning, that they're, they're connected to the regular vehicle air conditioning, or they just have cooling fans. And if you know customers throw a bunch of stuff in the back seat, they can't pull enough air. And so the battery will overheat and the car will shut off to protect itself. And they'll run it out of, out of fuel and kill the big battery. And that creates a, a whole cascading series of negative events. <laughs> um, you know, engine oil, they'll overfill the oil or they won't change the oil. I mean, there's all kinds of customer induced situations, but there's enough information on the internet now that a lot of customers should be really well educated before or after they buy a hybrid. So many of these challenges shouldn't exist today, but you know how customers can be sometimes. What needs to be done? Look, for hybrid specific systems, trained technicians have got to diagnose and, and repair. For conventional systems, any one of your technicians can diagnose and repair. It, it's, it's all the same type of stuff. And maintenance, anyone can do the maintenance on these cars. Okay, so really, unless it's a hybrid specific system, you treat it like a regular car. No problem, not, not, not even any safety concerns. All right, oil changes are still oil changes, brake jobs are still brake jobs. All right, but if it's a hybrid, 
you want to make sure you understand what you're working on before you go ripping it apart. And that's why I always told technicians, you know, don't take something for granted. Yes, it might look the same, but it may behave differently. Go look it up before you touch it. In summary, hybrid vehicles combine electric drive with conventional engines. They're bridging the gap from internal combustion to full-on electric. We've got hundreds of thousands of them on the road today. Trained technicians should service them, but most systems are conventional and you don't necessarily have to be a hybrid trained technician to work on them. And regular maintenance schedules absolutely need to be followed because they're, they still have moving parts, high temperatures, and we drive down the road at 70 miles an hour, I mean <clears throat> 65 miles an hour, and things go wrong. And so we've got to follow those regular maintenance schedules in terms of, of fluid exchanges, in terms of engine oil changes, air filters, all of that type of stuff. Okay, hope this helped understand a little bit. If you want to understand PowerFlow more, go Google some, some uh, hybrid animations and you'll find a whole bunch of video resources out there. Until next time, keep up the great work and never stop learning.